Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Parag Batavia. Uh, Parag teaches courses at Carnegie Mellon in the program I went to, the Master's in Robotic Systems Development, and was the president of NEA Systems, which makes self-driving trucks for the military. Parag, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Good to have you. I've been trying to kind of get to know more about you as a person uh, for a while now, and I've been hearing awesome stories about <laughs> sort of your contribution to the field uh, from my friend Mike from ICA yep. and other people as well. And uh, then I saw you were teaching MRSD, so yep. I sort of went up and tried to get to know you at one of those events. And That's I'm right. I remember that. Grateful you uh, you wanted to come on and do do my humble podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So you've been like pretty deeply involved in the Pittsburgh robotics scene for I'm quite old. a while. I yes, mean, I'm old. You'd mentioned, uh, was it 99 that you got your PhD? Yep. Yeah, that's okay. So that gives you a lot of legacy in this community. Uh, that's a, thank you for putting it that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I've been in Pittsburgh now almost 30 years. Nice. Uh, I came here in 95. Um, far longer than me. Uh, well, yeah. Um, yeah, I came here in 95 to uh, go to Carnegie Mellon. Um, I was always interested in robotics. Uh, I, I did my undergraduate at the University of Southern California cool. uh, in LA. And I, I had the, the luck to work in the robotics group over there as an undergrad. Uh, and they all said, if you want to do this as a career, um, you have to go to CMU, you have to go to the Robotics Institute, um, and yeah, it's Pittsburgh, but you still need to go there. Uh, and so I applied, uh, and you know, somebody must have mistyped a social security number or something, because I got in. Yeah, I felt um, the same way. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, so, so I got in, um, and then I, I still remember uh, my first time in Pittsburgh, they bring you in uh, to sort of do an orient, not, not an orientation, uh, like a recruiting weekend. Uh, and, and so it was like in March, so you know, not the most pleasant time in Pittsburgh. You know, and I'm coming from Los Angeles, yep. right? Which uh, never has a bad weather. Yep. Right, exactly. And, and you land, and it's gloomy and gray, and you know, uh, dark, uh, and and it's not. You know, I think, all right, is this really where I want to be? Uh, and then you go to CMU, right? And then they walk you through, and they they give you the recruiting spiel, and they show you all the robots, and you meet all the faculty. Uh, and I still went back thinking, oh, maybe I'll stay in LA. But I, I gave it a little bit of thought, and, and at that point, it was like, yeah, I was sold. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. Yeah, I was sold. So, so I came here in '95. Um, had the good fortune to work with uh, Chuck Thorpe and Dean Pomerleau, uh, a, a couple of the, the luminaries oh, cool. uh, in self driving, right? Some of the earliest developers and, and faculty involved in uh, autonomous vehicles. So I was part of the Nab Lab group. Um, I did nice. my PhD uh, in that space, looking at driver behavior and, uh, you know, are you a good driver? Are you a bad driver? How does that affect your warning times? Things like that. Uh, graduated in 99. Um, uh, went to, uh, spent a little bit of time at a company called Probotics. Uh, that was started by Henry Thorne. Oh, built interesting. a small robot called the Psy, which originally was a personal robot for home use. Um, and it pulled a little vacuum. It was the earliest robotic vacuum cleaner. He, he had a vision. He had a really good vision. Um, this was in the 90s he did this? This would have been 2000, like late 99, okay. early 2000. That's wild. Um, and so, you know, a little early for the home personal robot market space. Uh, so I left. Uh, I went back to C I went back to CMU. I joined NREC. Uh, but Henry spun it off into Athon, which nice. we know today. So, it's like a totally different company now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but... The, if you look at that robot and you, you look at Tug and you look at Psy, you can see the, the, linear, the linear progression between those two platforms. So well, That's interesting. So the engineering wasn't lost. No, wasn't not like at all. Just needed no, the entity. no, no, not at all. I, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of the core concepts uh, that he developed, uh, you know, in one market actually translated over to another. So it was a, it was a well, good example of a pivot. Time I see him. <laughs> yeah, it was a good example of a successful pivot. Yeah, um, cool. But for me, I went back to NREC uh, and I, I had fun working on robotic lawnmowers for about three years. Nice. So I worked on a project sponsored by the Toro Corporation. Uh, my field trials were in horrible places like country clubs in Minneapolis, <laughs> uh, and, and basically built you know lawnmowers that would go up and down golf courses and mow the fairways. Yeah, that was a big case study when I was doing the MRSD. I remember. Yeah, I, I didn't I, realize probably came out of your work. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so Sanjeev Singh was a faculty, uh, uh, you know, was sort of responsible for that work. But I was essentially the lead technical person on it. We had a very small team, uh, myself and a couple of others who did really all the development work. Um, but it was fascinating. It was the first time I got to spend three years working on one robot. Uh, and that is a luxury, right? You know, oh, for lot, sure. Yeah. A lot of times you're, you're moving between projects and doing all kinds of things. But three years working on one problem, one use case, 
uh, I got a lot out of that. So, so I had was a that like a lot of like quality assurance and testing, or what did? Oh, it was a lot of function, it functionality change? development. Oh, interesting. Right? I mean, we spent when we started it, uh, we thought the hardest problem was going to be obstacle detection, um, and we thought, oh, navigation will be pretty. Yeah, you're in a wide open golf field. You don't have to worry. You know, or a golf course. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything. Um, it turned out to be the exact opposite. Uh, it's not trivial, but not that hard to reliably detect golf balls and small different obstacles uh, on a nice, clear, grassy, green surface. Uh, lots of you know robust ways of doing that, e even 20 plus years ago. Um, so we, we did a pretty good job on that, but the navigation ended up being a challenge. Interesting. Uh, because you have to mow these perfectly straight lines, right? Um, and we used two centimeter GPS back when two centimeter GPS was a twenty plus thousand dollar solution. Um, How did it even work in those days? Uh, I thought there were like military safeguards against. So that was just at the end of that period. Okay. Right. So yeah. it was a couple of years after uh, selective availability got turned off or turned on, whichever way it was, uh, okay. and, and you could do something like that. But we had we had a physical base station, and awesome. you know, same as today, you send correction signals, right? So that, that whole concept hasn't really changed. So that's RTK then? Mm -hmm. It was okay, RTK. Cool. Yeah, it was the earliest RTK implementations. Uh, and, awesome. and we would still get, even back then, you get two centimeters. Uh, and, and so we would need that, but even then, we would lose primary GPS going underneath canopy. Yep. So if you're turning underneath a tree or something like Did that. Did you lose base station if you had a, a hill between? Yeah, I don't, base station, you know, we would we could position it, you know, we could control over that, right? So we could position right. that so that wouldn't really be an issue. Uh, but you would still lose primary GPS signal. And so we couldn't always be 100% reliable. Uh, and so that ended up being the real challenge. Um, and so again, I spent about three years working on that. Uh, then I got recruited to join a startup uh, called Applied Perception. Cool. It was started by... Um, started by Todd Yoakum, uh, who was part of the NavLab group. Uh, he was a grad student a few years ahead of me. Uh, he and uh, Dean Pomerleau spun out a company called Assistware many, uh, around the time I was graduating to focus on the, uh, on the um, sort of the, the trucking market for uh, lane departure warning systems. So, so they did a great job with that. How we got connected to Mike for Mica as a complete aside. But um, they, they took that company, they grew it uh, along with Mike um, and, and sold it. Uh, Todd spun off the defense side of that business. So they were working on commercial stuff at Assistware. Todd said, hey, we have these opportunities in defense. So he, he took, uh, took some of the technology uh, and some of the people and spun it off into Applied Perception. I joined that company. Um, spent uh, probably about four, five, six years working on cool defense robots. Cool. Uh, he sold that company in 2007. Um, then I ended up staying with the acquiring company for a couple of years. What kind of products did you do at that at the defense company? It was mostly R and D, uh, yeah. contract R and D. Oh, that's um, fun. Yeah, yeah, it was contract R and D for the Department of Defense, the Army SBIRs, things like that. Uh, some commercial work as well for ag companies. Nice. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a, one of the earliest acquisitions in the Pittsburgh area of a robotics company. Right, so it's wild. Uh, I stayed. The company that bought us was called Kinetic North America. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, so Q and A, right? They're here in town now. So would that have had to do with the Dragon Runner, or is that a separate so, acquisition? So it's, it was a separate acquisition at the exact same time. So that was that was Hagen and Automatica. Yep. Uh, and then Todd and Applied Perception, uh, both of them sold their company sort of as a roll-up deal almost. That makes uh, sense. To, it was really Foster Miller that acquired us, but they were owned by Kinetic through a, a chain. Um, uh, and so Dragon Runner was bought as sort of the small. EOD robot option for Foster Miller's product line. We were acquired to provide autonomy and software capabilities. Nice. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I stayed with, uh, after the acquisition, I stayed for about two years. Um, you know, Todd was transitioning out. Uh, so I got a lot of good operational experience, got to essentially run the organization for a couple of years, um, you know, get a really good education in budgeting and uh, you know, operations and sort of all the non technical side. Uh, of running a, a, a division in a large company. Um, decided it was time for me to do something different. So in 2009, I started looking around to see what was out there. Uh, I had a really interesting interview with a company out west who said, hey, we like what you're doing. We want, to do, we want you to do what you do in Pittsburgh. We want you to create a robotics group for us in Pittsburgh. We'll pay your salary, we'll provide you with travel support, all of that, but you need to go out, find the customers, hire the employees, you know, do all the operations, um, and, and set it up for us. And then I said, well, all right, if I'm going to do that, 
I might as well do it for myself because the only thing I don't get then is a sa is a salary, and I'm like, I'll take that risk. Uh, so I started Nea in 2009. Oh, nice! I didn't know you founded it. That's yeah, awesome. so I was a founder. I was a, I was a, the sole co-founder, or the sole founder of Nea. That's uh, wild. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I started in 2009. Um, we started, you know, with the SBIR route. Uh, we won our first SBIR uh, in late 2009, early 2010. We used that to hire our first employee in mid-2010 um, and then had a pretty, you know, generally successful trajectory of growth and profitability uh, and all that stuff uh, um, until 2017 when I sold the company uh, to our current owners, Applied Research Associates. Cool. Uh, so we were about 35-ish, 40-ish folks uh, when I sold the company. How long did you stick around after selling it? Well, I'm still there. Okay. Fair uh, enough. So, but but I stayed full time um, to to you know manage integration and yeah. all the transition stuff for about eighteen months. Cool. Uh, so I stepped down from uh, running Nea in uh, basically end of two thousand eighteen. All right, and my apologies. I just no, no, know Mike was president for a while. So yeah. So, was... so I brought Mike on board. Yeah, right? and, and, so, and that's so what I, he told me as well. Yeah. So, so, so I knew Mike uh, from time at Assistware years yep. and years ago. And he'd mentioned that also. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and like so uh, I brought Mike on board before I stepped down to sort of look at commercial business opportunities. Uh, he was looking for something to do after, uh, you know, after exiting uh, Three Rivers. Yeah. Uh, and, and we always work well together. So he came on board. Yeah, he's a great dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he came on board, did some stuff uh, around some commercial opportunities. I decided I wanted to transition out. Um, you know, we had a couple of candidates, uh, folks who could take over. Uh, Nea uh, and Mike ended up being selected. Uh, I thought he was a great choice. Uh, and then he, so he ran Nea basically at two or three years, something like that. Yeah. Uh, before leaving to join Alpha Lab Gear. Um, and then so at that point, uh, another old colleague of mine uh, who had hired by the name of Kurt Brock, uh, he was a Foster Miller Kinetic guy uh, in Boston, uh, had joined us to do business development. Um, and uh, he ended up uh, stepping into Mike's role. Uh, and now is uh, basically the division manager for NEA. Uh, he and I go way, way back, just like Mike. So the president title was phased out at that point. Yeah, essentially, yeah. the yeah the president title. So, so NEA is a uh, wholly owned subsidiary of Applied Research Associates. That makes sense, right? So, um, you know, you you'll have a title. Yeah, inside baseball, we have a title within sort of ARA, uh, which will be one title, and then you have a title within NEA. You know, within the NEA corporate structure. But oh. essentially, we are integrated now with uh, with Applied Research Associates. We are wholly a part of ARA in terms of everything that matters. Uh, we just maintain a separate corporate structure uh, for some contractual reasons. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I've seen that in a few different instances yep. of yeah. industry. Yeah. Cool. No, that's just interesting. I'm just, it's fascinating yeah. to hear kind of the origin stuff, story of a company that's doing really, really cool stuff yeah. like NEA. And hearing more about your background, it kind of makes sense why you would have positioned yourself to to start a business like that, and, and yeah. it's impressive that you took it all the way through acquisition. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it, it was a fun ride. The people that are able I, to do I had that. a lot of help, uh, both in terms of people I relied on for guidance and advice, and in terms of the employees, you know, who, who really made the company a success. Uh, I was very lucky to be a part of the Pittsburgh ecosystem at a time when uh, it was growing. Um, the robotics ecosystem, you know, at a time of growth and. Um, and, and, and some interesting change. Nice. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really cool story. We really focus on off-road autonomy. Yeah. Right? That, that's our bread and butter. Uh, we have what I still consider to be one of the uh, sort of most capable, reliable off-road autonomy stacks uh, anywhere. Yeah. Um, so we started, again, in the defense market. Uh, we, you know, we, we did the tr sort of traditional defense route of writing SBIRs and doing some technology development. Uh, on the government's dime, graduated to larger contracts, uh, build good partnerships with uh, other, you know, defense primes, um, Northrop Grumman and other companies like that. Oh, cool. Uh, so we'd be a subcontractor to them. Sometimes they'd be a subcontractor to us. Uh, that was a good education in, you know, kind of working with the big boys. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and again, we had, you know, a solid run of developing really good off-road autonomy technology. We saw uh, applications and opportunities to transition that to commercial uh, organizations. Uh, and so we've done some of that as well, you know, in, in sort of the construction and mining space. That us. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's nice. It, it's sort of that success story of using defense and federal funding to develop core technology, you know, within the spirit of the SBIR program where a lot of the intellectual property still mostly resides with the company. 
um, especially for commercial use, and then then finding the right commercial customers uh, who are looking for solutions to similar problems in different domains, uh, and building those relationships as well. So yeah. you know, that is still essentially the pathway uh, that NEA is on. Uh, it does a, you know, a large proportion of its business uh, is federal contracts, uh, and a substantial portion of it is a combination of work for hire and other types of work with commercial organizations as well. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, and I feel like mining is kind of a fun sector, and I, yeah. I haven't worked as much in defense, so I don't know it. But when I when I worked for Joy Global, I remember like a lot of the interesting bits about it, or I guess maybe I don't know if I call it enabling, but it was neat that it wasn't so highly regulated as like a self driving car. In the yeah, that you could sort of do more. Well, it's 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 more controlled, right? Yeah, of I course. Mean, I obviously, mean, a you're surface in, mine. Yeah, is, yeah, an open pit surface mine is a very different environment. Yep. Uh, than a, a city street. Well, and there's all sorts of dangerous stuff going on by nature of the operations. Mm -hmm. People have training to know how to interact mm -hmm. with that. They're used to working with equipment and machinery yep. and a certain level of automation. Yep. Uh, you're, you're dealing with a highly educated, trained, uh, you know, set of personnel. Yeah. And as a result, you can get robots out there doing mm -hmm. stuff a lot easier. Yeah. I think. And, I mean, it's and, not know, easy, but it's easier. It's it's viable. Yeah. Right? It's feasible fundamentally. That's a good uh, word for it. I, I think the AV industry, you know, a lot of lessons have been learned in in the last five years and the attempts at developing sort of you know level five autonomy and getting deployment out. And you know, I think a lot of uh, you know, there there's some optimism about how all of that was going to go, which I think yeah, you know, it wasn't completely borne out. Yeah. Um, but it's a really hard problem. Oh, for uh, sure. And I look at what the companies in town have accomplished, uh, especially having my background uh, of having worked on that in that space, you know, twenty plus years ago, and seeing what is possible today. Uh, you know, it's day and night. Yeah, uh, in terms I of agree. the capabilities of uh, a lot of these companies. But well, at least from when I was getting involved ten years ago. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it, it's 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 absolutely day and night. I mean, there's a phenomenal amount of progress in the last five years by autonomous vehicle companies in Pittsburgh and, and in other locations. But it's still, there's still open challenges. Uh, yeah, and quite difficulties a few, around regulatory deployment. and technical. Absolutely, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's an interesting societal question about at what point are we comfortable with, they're never gonna be 100% perfect, right? You know, uh, are we- People what, aren't. Yeah, people aren't, right? Um, mm. But how do you get to that transition point of saying, all right, they're better than people. You know, they probably aren't yet. Um, yeah, I concur. But you know, at some point, they probably will be better than people. Yeah. But you're still going to have accidents caused purely by autonomous vehicles. But how do you, as a society, accept the fact that all right, there are still accidents, but over the long span of time, there's fewer accidents than there would have been in a purely, uh, you know, human-driven world. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever yeah. get there. Uh, I don't know if we'll get there technically. I don't know if we'll get there societally. You know, I kind of feel like a hundred years from now. I can easily see we'll that happening. Probably have it hundred years from now, or something different. But I don't know what that pathway of. is, right? I can't. Yeah. I, I'd be horrible at predicting what that pathway. But well, nobody is. knows. I mean, we right. thought like, and, and this is kind of a recurring theme for me on the show. But I watched the Jetsons growing up. I mean, <laughs> our perception of you know probably several decades ago. I don't know what that's meant to depict. Was right. flying cars, right, and, right, right. You know, sure. robots that'll clean your house, and we don't have that yet. But if you look at ag construction, mining, defense, warehousing, logistics, healthcare. These are all areas where automation is entirely feasible, yep. where there are valid business cases for it, yeah. where they're still addressing multi-billion dollar markets, yep. um, where I think over the last five years, uh, you know, uh, it's been a little starved of capital and talent and, um, and startups, uh, and that market hasn't been addressed quite as fully as it could have been because so much of our time and energy and capital and, and, and people were, were in the uh, self-driving space. Oh, interesting. Um, Wait, so which market in particular are you talking well, about? Well, I would think about you know, anything related to field robotics. Okay, right? okay The stuff it. FRC does so well, yeah. for instance. Um, you know, again, ag, construction, mining, defense, space, uh, warehousing, logistics. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So the self-driving was just paying everybody I mean, off market. Yeah, it's, it's, you know. Had a lot of engineers on lock. Th this is not, exactly, right? And it's not an uncommon thing yeah. in, in a maturing uh, industry and market space where a sense. lot of talent and capital gets locked up in one direction. That direction may or may not work out. At some point, that talent gets unlocked and yeah. gets applied to, you know, it, it, I, I teach my students about the Gartner hype cycle. Yeah, right? that's, so, uh, I love that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, we're at a certain point in that hype cycle where 
we're probably hitting that downward Peak of curve. inflated expectations. Exactly. exactly. And trough of dif- disillusionment. And, 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 you know, in some ways we're getting into that. Um, yeah. But when you come out the other side, uh, you know, you hit that plateau of productivity and you figure yeah. out what the real applications are. And, and all the driverless car work that's been done will lead to better safety and better ADAS and, you know, we'll have a place uh, on the road. Uh, and maybe the full vision of self-driving vehicles yeah. will be realized. But even if it's not, uh, I think there's going to be so much benefit to other industries from all of that work yeah. uh, that, you know, it's hard to look at any of that and say it was wasted, even if it doesn't get to the original uh, desired endpoint. For sure. When I was recently trying to purchase a used car and just looking at, you know, the ADAS and the luxury car yeah. market, you know, like in five year increments, mm-hmm. it was pretty incredible <laughs> seeing the progress we've made. I, I bought my daughter, uh, you know, probably the, the lowest end SUV you could buy of a certain brand. Um, and the ADAS that it has in it uh, wouldn't have been in like the highest you know trim of that same manufacturer five years ago. The tech just didn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. Or if it did, it was you know reserved for the highest option level and the highest trim. Yeah. Um, and so now you're seeing all of that propagate downwards. Uh, you know the interesting thing is, do you see does all that result in changed accident rates, or do you get into what happened with anti-lock brakes? Oh, I see. Well, actually, I don't know the anti-lock brake. Okay. I was thinking more of the Airbus stall issue or use Oh, case. no, no, no. I'm not thinking about, no. So, Over-reliance um, on automation and yeah. people get complacent, but okay. Uh, uh, well, there's a little bit of that. So, so that's yeah. kind of it, right? It's, um, if you look at when anti-lock brakes were, uh, were introduced, you saw a dip in the accident rate, and then you saw it kind of come back up. To, oh, interesting. Because you have this thing called risk homeostasis. Uh, people will behave to a certain level of risk. And if there's a safety system that prevents something bad from happening, they'll be just a little bit that more aggressive on average. Oh, that's uh, right. So you, yeah. you get, yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, uh, seatbelt, all, all of that stuff has had a massive yeah. impact on, <laughs> on, yeah, on, on driver and passenger safety. But there's a little bit of human behavior like, all right, I've got this thing that will keep me on the highway. I don't have to worry about that. Maybe I won't pay quite as much attention as I used to. I actually just bought an all-wheel drive car, and it was a really snowy day, and I was like, oh, this thing's grippy as hell. Let me mm-hmm. see what I can do on Fifth Avenue. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I've I swung had, it out a little bit and was like, okay, that's what I can do. <laughs> I, I've had an electric vehicle for years, and yeah. electric vehicles are great because at least mine is all-wheel drive. Oh, nice. And you've got a battery pack, really a super heavy battery pack, really low to the ground. Nice. So you get great traction. So there's always that, oh, I have got, nothing bad can happen to me. I have great traction. It doesn't matter how much it's raining. It doesn't matter what the snow is like. I'll just pretend it's, you know, everything's kind of, you know, dry and nice. Uh, and we'll see what happens, right? But if you behave that way. What are you running, if I can ask? Oh, um, so I just, uh, I had a Tesla for quite a while. Nice. Um, I ended up, uh, I was at the six, seven year mark about when the battery warranty expires. That makes sense. So it was time to trade it in before I, you know, got past the battery warranty. Uh, so I got a, a Mercedes. Uh, oh, nice. They have a new electric vehicle line. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I've seen the Porsche ones. I haven't seen the Mercedes ones up close. Yet. Yeah. They're, um, you know, it's interesting, right? Mercedes knows how to build cars. I mean, yeah, most sure. car manufacturers know how to build cars. <laughs> Tesla was learning how to build cars. So it, as many cool things as there are, I had the weirdest problems with my, you know, I see people have the weirdest problems. But like what kind of stuff, if I can ask? Uh, I've replaced every door handle. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, control arm, uh, the, the center that's screen. That's fairly normal with the control arm. Yeah, the that's, screen, not, that's not quite as a big a deal. But um, the center instrument panel. Was that like an ESD issue? I, this is like the engineering nerd. In yeah, I don't remember. Uh, honestly, I don't remember anymore. No worries. I'm not even sure I ever knew. Uh, We've gotten jobs uh, with clients of ours having their electronic panels going out and like multiple millions of dollars a year in RMA cost. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Like, what's wrong? And, like, Well, turns out after an, oh, you know, detailed it, inspection, your installation techs aren't wearing, or your yeah. you know, your techs on the line aren't wearing their wrist straps and that's what's right. causing and that's the core, that's the that's the root cause of the problem. Yep. <laughs> no, my, my, my instrument cluster started leaking goo. Oh geez, um, what kind of goo? Some kind of bonding fluid that would melt. That's interesting. Because at that time, of, and I don't know this, you know, for certain, but what I read on like Reddit was, yeah. uh, oh, they, you know, I think they were using uh, instrument grade, or, or excuse me, um, industrial grade uh, components instead of automotive grade components, you know, very early on. Oh, Maybe, I, again, I, you know, I have no idea whether that's real or not. But yeah. it was leaking goop, that part was real. <laughs> that's wild. Uh, and then you had to pay to replace it, right? Because it's not a warranty. 
So brutal. It, it's just weird problems. Yeah. Which is kind of understandable when you've got a brand new company developing a brand new manufacturing. And trying line. to figure out better ways to do it. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, when I used to work for SpaceX just as an intern in like mm -hmm. 2013, I remember like one of the mentalities that that company had that I'm sure Tesla probably shares is, you know, why are people doing it this way? Surely we can right. figure out a better yeah, way to do course. this. Which is one of the and things that And a lot of times that makes absolute companies sense. Companies grow, right. yeah, and, and you know, dominate their competitors. But sometimes, but sometimes you're sometimes, ignoring 20, 30 years of wisdom and experience and says, this is why you do something. <laughs> yeah. Right? Or in some cases, I mean, I've seen companies I've worked with ignore hundreds of years of Absolutely. wisdom and experience. And, Go fast and break things. Yep, yeah, yep, exactly. which is nice in software, but in hardware it can be, you know. Expensive. Sometimes you're literally break. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so I figured and now. Sometimes it works out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, now you've got so much competition in the EV space, yeah. right? Uh, essentially, every auto manufacturer ha it has or will soon have uh, an electric vehicle line. So, yeah. at least for me, there was no reason to stay with, you know, I figured I might as well go to a company that I know knows how to, they may have other problems, yep. but I know the doors are going to work. I know, you know, <laughs> I know the core functionality is going to, you know, is going to work. So yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. How's the performance as opposed to the Tesla on the Mercedes? Oh no, it's fun. Uh, nice. <laughs> it's very comparable. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah, that sounds like a blast. Yeah, <laughs> that was definitely one of my favorite things about like I just drove a few buddies Teslas and just the the acceleration. Yeah, I mean, it's unparalleled in a petrol vehicle. Uh, I think there might yeah. be one or two, but they're like hyper cars that can sort of yeah. It, I see. I think that's up. right. I think it, it it will take almost anything except maybe some multi million dollar hyper cars off the line. Yep. Which is crazy when you think about it. Yeah, for sure. Like, in essentially, like, if you got a Model 3, that's basically an economy car. You're right. That's, <laughs> that's right. right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, so. like pretty wild. Yep. Yeah, my brother just got one, and I, I got, like, a, you know, like I said, just I just bought, like, a used Lexus, and, and I was bragging about my 5.5 seconds 0 to 60, and he was like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't even. Yeah, I think the top of the line Teslas will do 2.8 or something like yeah, that. Something like that. Like, it's insane. crazy. It's, it's just on a different I mean, scale. Yeah. So, But, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see the EV market mature, right? Yeah, it's for good sure. good to see technology markets mature in general. You know, we're seeing it, obviously, in the EV space. We're certainly starting to see it in the robotic space. Absolutely. Um, I talk to my students all the time about recognizing, you know, real from hype. Right, you know, I, I not always easy, by the way. No, it's not. It's not. Like I definitely thought we were going to have self-driving cars five years ago. I mean, interesting. Okay. They drank the CMU Kool Aid. Yeah, the old drink. Uh, I don't think it was a CMU Kool Aid. I think it was. <laughs> Touche. I, 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 I want to hear your take on I, this. I, my take is that um, the folks who are running the AV companies are all absolutely. They know the challenges they face. I think they're taking very big swings at solving those challenges. Uh, I think there's a, a set of folks surrounding all the developers and technologists who understandably don't have that same background yeah. and are willing to say, oh, yeah, maybe we can solve this in five years if we throw enough money at it. Um, but again, I think you, know, you make progress by taking really big swings at yeah. really hard problems. And if you're not failing sometimes, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah, I agree with so, that completely. Yeah. All right, so it might have just been a translation error that maybe, maybe that's what yeah, you're I, 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 and it's also just you know macroeconomically we've had years of uh, cheap and free money, right? So venture was always willing to take a much larger risk uh, in order to try to look for a return than yep. you know probably the uh, probably the the what we're heading into over the next two correct, years. yeah, and what we're already seeing. I mean, yeah. this year, right? Yeah. So you know we're, we're going to see sort of the pendulum move the other way, which. Is inevitable, um, and, and if you're somebody who's been in the working world for almost 30 years now, you've seen that pendulum go back and forth. Uh, if you're somebody who's in your mid-20s and this is your first or second job, it could seem a little scary um, yep. to see you know offers change and layoffs happen and all that stuff. But you know, my advice to all of them is stick it out, do your yep. best to get through, and it will go back the other way. Yeah, you know, it that always makes does sense to me. Yeah. It's always comforting when I hear someone say that because, like, I mean, I have a lot of friends and mentors that have been doing this longer than me. Um, you know, I, I probably came online in, in the early 2010s with regard to doing serious robotics mm -hmm. work. Sure. And, um, you know, whenever I talk to certain people, they're like, I've lived through three recessions. Yeah, right. You know, That's right. It always comes back. So, yeah. I remember you know, 2008. I remember yeah. the dot com crash. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> Uh, I was in I had grad a boss school. That was, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was in grad school during the dot com crash, so I missed the run up, and I wasn't really affected by the, 
Nice. But by the fallout either. <laughs> I, well, yeah. Good all, dodge. All, all, my, all my friends were becoming Microsoft millionaires, yep. right, that I graduated college with, but whereas I was still in grad school making, I think CMU paid grad students 12000 a year at that point, something like that, right? That's what we lived on. Big but money. <laughs> it, it was back then. Um, but it always comes back, right? Yeah. Uh, I started NEA in 2009, right? Just right after the 2008 recession. Um, and so, you know, what I also tell my students is companies that start when you've got headwinds, uh, the ones that make it end up coming out of the other end much stronger. Oh, for right? sure. I mean, again, having started in A in 2009, we were just getting into when VCs would even look at a robotics company. Uh, so the idea of going and raising wasn't really something I considered. So it was like, all right, what are other avenues of, of getting uh, revenue, right? You know, SBIRs and government work. Um, and we certainly need to be profitable. The idea that I could run at a loss for multiple years just wasn't a thing because I would literally be self-funding that. Yep. Um, and so we always cared about revenue and profitability. And I tell That's, my students, uh, I feel like you don't see that enough. Um, you don't see that enough, but it's also completely understandable in a lot of ways. Yeah. Right. Well, Certain some problems you can't solve. Correct. In a revenue positive. Some way. companies you have to run at a loss for years. Yeah. You're either, you're either developing a technology, you're buying growth, whatever that is. Um, you know, venture has a, the primary role, I would say, uh, in uh, enterprise development. But again, in 2009, uh, if I wanted to start a robotics company, uh, it would have been hard to go out and raise. Uh, and there weren't very many, there weren't that many of us. So you bootstrapped that thing entirely. Mm -hmm. Entirely, yeah, I never took any external funding. That's awesome. Yeah, so um, again, yeah, I, I, it was the way I wanted to go, it, you know. Probably a little bit my personality. That makes um, sense. You know, not wanting to worry about that, uh, about worrying to, you know, not wanting to worry about the investors. and Having to fight them. a board at your own company. Yeah, I mean, certainly some of that comes with the territory of having investors. And I prefer to have, you know, unofficial advisors who I respect and ask for advice as opposed to here's who is on your board now, right? Yeah. So that, but that's just me personally. It also means that, I, you know, it was always going to be very unlikely that I'd build a billion dollar company um, because it's very hard to bootstrap a billion dollar company. But I wasn't <laughs> trying. That, that was never my personal goal. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I feel like I accomplished my personal goal and, you know, fortunate to be able to do that. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's I, I had no idea that um, that you never raised for that. That's that's actually pretty awesome to know. And yeah, it's I, I tell my students now that it's um, I don't know that I would do that today. Uh, I think I was probably in the last sort of generation of companies that could legitimately do that without taking on even more risk. Yeah. Uh, because there are so many more robotics. We have a hundred plus companies in Pittsburgh alone. Yeah. Right. Yeah, these days. Right. And yeah. when I in, in you know when I was at NREC, there were maybe four or five. Right. There was Red Zone and RE Squared and couple of others, K2T, a couple others. Um, when I started NEA in 2009, there were maybe a dozen. Could yeah. be wrong, uh, but there weren't that many. Um, yeah. And now we have 100. So, that's awesome. And that's just Pittsburgh alone, right? And if you look nationwide, you look worldwide, uh, competition is out there. And, and so if you want to be competitive, that means you've got to be fast. You've got to have good technology, good market. If you want to be fast, market, you have to be able to finance that. And, and growth takes money, right? Yeah. So it's very difficult now to completely bootstrap a startup uh, in robotics. Um, well, and to bootstrap a product startup in general is oh, that'd be different. Yeah, I mean, and, and a service company. We were more of a service company. One thing. Okay. Right? It's, again, right, we, we certainly fell into certain types of software sort of products. Uh, you know, not at the scale of, hey, I've sold thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies we did some licensing deals you know and, and some obviously a lot of leveraging of existing technologies with new customers yeah um, but that's a little different than what you would consider sort of a hardware product company yeah right? and, and and building a hardware product company takes resources takes time takes money uh, it's a very difficult different and difficult thing um, and, and so you know in my class we talk about all those different sort of avenues that you can go down uh, and sort of what the pluses and minuses of those are I'm still really sad. I missed your version <laughs> of that school. <laughs> I want my money back, CMU. No, no, you got you. You, you ended up with a great degree. Uh, <laughs> no, I did. I definitely did. Um, yeah. So, but I had fun with it. You know, yeah. I get to sort of. I spend two semesters on a soapbox, basically yeah. telling students, "All right, this is how I would do it." 
Yeah. Um, hopefully they get something out of it. I put them through essentially the NSFI core process. Uh, so they have to pick a startup idea uh, in their team, right? So I keep them within their, and you're familiar with how Immersity is, I keep them within their teams. Yeah, so this um, is a project for people listening that right. the students will build. And I think these days it goes through multiple semesters. Mm -hmm. So you build it over, what, two years? Uh, two or? years, I believe, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I keep them within their teams. They don't have to do a business around their MRSD project. Some Although some of them are going to. Some of them are going to, but, yeah. but that can be really difficult in some cases. Oh, right? absolutely. So, some lend themselves to it. In some every don't. case. Uh, some of them are pretty, some of them I think are pretty translatable. Yeah. But uh, they have to pick their... I would still call it difficult. <laughs> uh, it's difficult no matter what, yes. Yeah. Um, they have to pick their uh, product, they have to pick an idea. Yeah. Uh, they present it and then they have to go out and do customer discovery. So I make them get out into the real world, talk to 30, 40 customers. Uh, and go through that whole customer discovery process, uh, and then they do. You know, they'll they won't really develop an MVP, but they'll think about what does an MVP look like, uh, and they'll do a customer validation process. Hey, have we really? You know, have we figured out a pain point? Do we have a viable solution to that pain point? Can we? You know, is it feasible? Is it uh, usable? Um, you know, can we actually build it? Uh, and then does it really solve your problem for you? Right? Uh, you know, I tell them you're going to spend a year with me. If at the end of that year, you realize that the first thing you need to do is not say, oh, I have a cool technology, Build it. but say, I have to go talk to customers. Yep. Right? If you come out with that, <laughs> then I've done my job. That's awesome. Uh, and I think most of them realize that. So kinda I kind of wish I, someone had told me that sooner. It's, I was like, we all were like that. You know, well, I call it engineering scene. hubris. It's engineering I think. hubris, absolutely. Yeah. We all have that. Um, yeah. I like off-road robotics. I'm going to do stuff in off-road robotics. Yeah. Off-road autonomy, right? Wouldn't it be cool to make this thing? Yeah. Regardless yeah. of if anyone would buy it. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so it's we all fall prey to that. Uh, some of us still manage to come out the other side despite all of those mistakes. And, you know, other companies don't. Um, but There's I some to, people, you know, their company might fail, but then they'll start another company. Yeah, absolutely. And of course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all the time. <laughs> good to fail in a couple of companies and learn yeah. from that and. Um, you know, VCs look at that not as a failure, but all right, he's probably learned, so, you know, he or she's probably learned something at that point. Yep. So, yeah, so maybe a little lower risk in taking a chance on them. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. And you even hear those anecdotes within larger organizations where it's not a founder, but maybe it's some kind of director mm -hmm. or, you know, a VP or something that, you know, makes a mistake that costs yep. the company millions of dollars, you know, and, you know, there's those you know, famous stories of like, well, you know, why would I fire that person? I just spent $2 million training them. Right, exactly. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, there, there's mistakes due to inattention, incompetence, and, you know, hubris. And there's mistakes due to, hey, look, I did what I thought was right. This is what the data told me. We turned out to be wrong. Uh, and those are the mistakes you want to cultivate. Yeah, for right? sure. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Um, uh, well, okay, so um, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, well. I'm on the board of the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. So Love if those you, guys. Yep, absolutely. If you are a robotics startup in the Pittsburgh area, you probably already know about it. But if you happen to be listening to Highest us, value organization. And you don't know about it, it is a high value organization. <laughs> I strongly recommend you reach out to us and join. Um, uh, th there's also a new robotics factory being launched. Uh, through Innovation Works, um, it's part of the Build Back Better program. Uh, so this is a 60 plus million dollar federal grant to a number of organizations in the Pittsburgh area, a number of nonprofits in the Pittsburgh area, to look at uh, to look at and improve the overall uh, robotics automation and manufacturing ecosystem in our area. So it's yeah. looking at areas of workforce development, of diversity and inclusion, of new enterprise creation. Uh, and so one of the ones that I've been somewhat involved in is the creation of the Robotics Factory. Uh, it's being run out of Innovation Works. Um, if you look online, you'll find a website, you'll find social media, you will find they have a call for uh, new companies and entrepreneurs to apply to be a part of the initial cohort. I've been forwarding Mike's posts on LinkedIn Good. to people so, I know that yep, are exactly, trying to get into that exactly. space. So I strongly recommend uh, if you are interested in ent robotics entrepreneurship, uh, take a look at it and see if it makes sense for you to apply. Cool. So Pittsburgh Robotics Network and uh, Robotics Factory yeah. for people that want to grow the robotics startup here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, hey, All right. thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Appreciate yours.